So thank you all for coming to our 2019 Research Sprints Showcase. Uh, my name is Rebecca Orozco. I'm a science and engineering librarian here. And this year I had the honor of co-chairing the Sprints Committee with my colleague, oh, Karna. Um, so the Sprints sit in the faculty center here at the libraries, but really we try and get everyone involved. So um, I'm going to try and make my introduction brief so that we can get to the projects because we had two really good projects this year. We had a total of 10 applications, which is the most applications we've had since we've been doing the sprints. Um, so I think the two people we picked have some really good uh, projects. So we're going to, first we're just going to introduce the teams, then we're going to let them do their presentations. They'll be about 10, 15 minutes. If you go a little over, that's totally fine. Um, and then Karn is going to wrap us up with some acknowledgments at the end. So our first team <laughs> is Dr. Sarah Gregg. She is in the history department, and she also has an appointment in the environmental studies program. So her team was Greta Valentine. She was the project manager. Um, Rhonda Hauser helped with all of the GIS stuff. Carmen Morris Alfie helped with government documents and some open pedagogy and things like that. Sarah Morris was also on the team and she helped finding historical documents and it was a good match because she also has a really strong background in rural agriculture and things like that. Um, Josh Bullock, Ryzen, uh, Brian Rosenblum, and Tanashri all helped be um, cons helped with consultations. So Josh helped with like open access and copyright and all those kinds of things. Dinashri and Brian were really helpful with um, the digital humanities aspect of their project. So thank you all for that. Hey, Rebecca. I just want to acknowledge, too, Caitlin Foster, oh, Sarah's we'll student. Do. Yeah, we can acknowledge he just graduated, helped a lot with the GIS and other work. So Sarah's project was entitled Kansas Homesteading. It's more interesting and complicated than you would expect. And we're going to hear from her shortly. <coughs> And then the second team this year was Melissa Peterson, and she is in the Applied English Center. Um, her project manager was Mary Rappel, and um, Mary and both Fran Devlin both have experience working with international students, which she is kind of like one of the focuses of her project. Samantha Bishop Simmons, she helped a lot with like um, information literacy and those kinds of things. Karna helped with open pedagogy. Natalie helped with uh, tutorials and like all of those kinds of learning objects. And Josh also consulted with them on open access and all of that good stuff. And her project was titled Developing an Open Source Textbook for Undergraduate Research and Academic Technology Skills. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Gregg's team, and they're going to show you their project. <clears throat> well, thank you all for being here. Um, this has been a really uh, exciting and intense week, I think, for all of the sprinters. Um, but for my part, I'm especially grateful because this is like my dream team here. Um, uh, the librarians at uh, KU Libraries, with whom I've had a chance to work this week, are the people I always come to over and over with questions. Um, we're looking for advice, and so it's really exciting. Sarah, you should come up here, please. <laughs> um, uh, and so it's been a real pleasure. So I'm grateful to the committee, I'm grateful to the libraries, I'm grateful to the university for having this opportunity. So I applied for a research sprint because I am in the middle of writing a book on the history of homesteading that involves some really deep dives into landscape and uh, negotiations over space and policy and uh, place, um, space and place being a little bit different there. And I want to find a way to make my work more accessible to the communities that are, uh, that it's relevant to. And so I've struggled with how to do this um, over the last couple of years. I have all this material, all of these ideas, and right now they all live on my computer, on my bookshelves rather than being spread out more broadly. And so 
I envisioned using uh, the S3 story map tool as a means of creating an online curated exhibit of local history. Um, but I also wanted to build a story map um, as a template for a class that I teach. I have a required environmental studies course called Environmental Law, and I ask my students to craft a legislative history and then to step back from the, the weeds, essentially, of this, these historical developments in order to present it to a public audience like what it means <coughs> to have passed the Clean Water Act of 1970, for example, or Clean Air Act of 1970. Um, and so we also developed a sort of a prototype or a model for legislative history. Um, and so everyone's going to speak as we walk through these story maps because we all did different parts of, uh, participated in different parts of them, but just as a means of introducing all of this. Um, so essentially, uh, I was interested in introducing a 19th century piece of legislation because the students I work with have to work on the 20th century. But I'm asking them to, in essence, distill all of the complex negotiations over a political idea, a policy program, um, through a narrative form in the story map. So here, there's lots of text. Um, one of the things that's really remarkable about this team is we were able to collaborate on pulling together the votes in Congress, mapping tools, uh, the sort of trajectory of bills introduced in Congress, and pull this all together. So I'm going to let every, what, I mean, it actually required four people working for a day and a half to make four of these maps. So I'm going to, yeah. So Greta, um, tell us a little bit about what. <laughs> so I had a really easy job, actually, because everyone else had the functional skills to actually build these maps and find the research that went into them. I did get to use Python a little bit to kind of merge some data that went into making the maps. But other than that, I was kind of helping people stay organized, kind of doing check-ins and seeing when we needed to be focusing on different tasks. But really, Caitlin and Rhonda did the heavy lifting on Lightroom and making the maps and Armin and Sarah did a lot of the research that went into creating those, but I think that with this team, I had a pretty easy job, honestly. I think Greta's being a little humble here because <laughs> we literally true. could not have made these maps with the work that she did. Um, by putting all of those votes in a spreadsheet, we were able, or I was able to take that information and join it with uh, legislative districts that had been uh, coordinated into shape files uh, with a former project at UCLA. And we were able to make those maps and visualize just where people went voting for whatever political reason. Maybe they were absent. Maybe they didn't want to vote because it wouldn't have looked good for their constituents, but they didn't want to stop the legislation from passing. Uh, and so you can see there's a slight there's sectional divide over the idea of, quote, free land um, in 1860 votes. And so this is really, nobody has ever been able to map this before. And so by using our collective uh, expertise, now it is possible to visualize what it looked like, the sectional divide in the years leading up to the Civil War, just how significant um, those differences were over the question of what would happen uh, in the Western territories as the nation state continued to move um, into new lands. Um, Rhonda, do you want to add anything about uh, the maps? Yeah, I haven't had a really, I don't think any of us have had a chance to like really look at them and examine them. We've been in scrambling to just get the story maps put together and get the information there. So thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, no, it was just, it was really a team effort. I was really thankful to have Caitlin helping and, and doing some of the GIS. And we learned um, a new way to, to push the data up into the ArcGIS online where we were creating the web maps. So that was, that was interesting to be able to do that. Also, we were using desktop GIS software to push it up into the cloud. And what, what Rhonda was able to do is now create uh, this this image, this this plot, the, the basically layer, right? right? Or tile is now going to be accessible for everyone around the world who uses S3 software. So from here on out, anybody who's interested in talking about political change in the 19th century and is looking for historical maps or maps of voting history be able to say, oh wow, look at this. Like this is a really great way to visualize 
um, this political change. So we have four of these maps for each of the major Senate and House votes. One, well, a map for each of the major House and Senate votes. Um, first in the period leading up to Buchanan's veto in 1860, and then in the 1862 uh, second session of the Senate Congress. So I just want to say not just limited to the ESRI software, but people will be able to access it on the web, like via the free uh, web mapping tools, and then with open source GIS software too, you'll be able to get to it. So since our topic was open, <laughs> we want to make a note of that. And so we're scrolling through really quickly. All of the, the story maps are going to be available on, uh, I don't know how, through on the web. <laughs> <laughs> so you can all look at them more closely over the course of the next weeks. And we'll make sure to send out an email with it. Yeah. So can take it. yeah. I might add that we're still working on the, the uh, uh, appropriate titles for those maps. And we have decided what they are, but um, out of fear of breaking our maps for today. We have not um, edited the metadata associated with it, so um, that's to come later. Right, so just to step back a little bit and give you a bigger sense of what we were trying to do. So as we started out, we basically idea mapped this, this particular story map. And we were looking to discuss what wasn't working in uh, land policy up until the 1860s. And the issue was Congress uh, had a policy of selling land off to prospective settlers. And so, um, but with the, can we go back to that last image? Please? So with the vast public domain, however, essentially I asking people to pay a dollar or two dollars an acre in order to go out and settle just wasn't working. And so there was a lot of illegal squatting. There was a lot of preempting of land claims. There were claims clubs that were essentially enforcing their sense of ownership by force. Um, and so what we wanted to do, what I was really interested in doing, was demonstrating how this policy innovation essentially came to play out uh, on, the, in, on the floor of Congress. So land policy clearly wasn't working. So the idea beginning in the mid 1840s was that Congress could give land for free um, to prospective Euro-American settlers. Now, of course, this is really deeply tied into the stories of dispossession, um, which we'll see more in our next story map. But we were really focusing on the top-down policy aspect for this particular part of the project. So Congress essentially uh, debated this idea of, quote, free land over the course of basically the period from 1846 to 1862 when the legislation ultimately was signed by President Lincoln. And in part, the reason it was able to pass Congress was the southern states seceded. And so it, with secession, Congress passed four major pieces of agri agricultural law, the Homestead Act, the Morrill Land Grant Act, uh, the creation of the US Department of Agriculture, and the Pacific Railway Act, essentially knitting the nation together and distributing land in a totally different way. Um, so just to get back to homesteading, though, essentially, so if we So essentially what happened is in the period between 1868 when the first claims were proved up and the late 1870s when Kansas homesteading reached its peak, you see this sort of significant um, uh, transformation or I guess, momentum, I suppose, in terms of successful final claims um, that continued into the 20th century, which is a different part of my book. So what we decided to do collectively in consultation with Josh um, in particular is to then <coughs> license this under the Creative Commons, uh, <coughs> what is it, Josh? <coughs> Attribution non commercial. Okay, yeah. yep, so, right. Um, and, uh, and so essentially we've got a lot of availability of this material. So then the next story map will move through much more quickly. It's in many ways a more robust and interesting tool, but ultimately we decided I am focusing on Ottawa County, Kansas, which is um, this county right here. Um, it is just north of Salina, the county seat of Minneapolis. And so I'm in my work, I'm studying the, the 
transformation of native lands to uh, divided lands under the terms of the nation state and then I'm following a homesteading family um, in their experience on the land. But so what I wanted to do was place that story of native movement and use and then native dispossession and the expansion of the nation state and the movement of Euro-American settlers all into context, um, which meant essentially we decided to choose a story map tour so that we, our you sort of viewers, could get a feel for this place and the various layers of history um, that are represented in this particular region of Kansas. So uh, Greta found this amazing, uh, is it a lithograph? Of um, a place called Wakanda Springs. How many of you have heard of Wakanda Springs? Okay, so it's a sacred uh, Kanza and Pani site um, it's currently underneath Wakanda Lake, um, just uh, near Cocker City. Um, and it had been a ceremonial and spiritual site for, the, for a variety of different native tribes. Um, but was also a place that was uh, to be protected in the minds of the various tribal groups in the region. And so um, it re represented something of a flashpoint. We also wanted to talk about the progression of the railroads. So the railroad hit Solomon City, Kansas in March of 1867, and tracks were laid through to Ellis, Kansas by, Mar uh, by October of 1867. So that's 120-some miles of track laid over the course of about five months, which is pretty remarkable. So here's the Ellis Roundhouse. So again, we wanted to give a sense of change, the changes that were taking place over the course of the first several decades of the 19th century in this place. Um, and let's talk, uh, Rhonda and Caitlin, if you would please talk a little bit about the, um, the map itself. Um, sure, so with this template, we, we kind of decided to focus on the photo, so it gets a larger area, but all of those <laughs> photos are tied to a location, as you probably figured out. Um, so that little base map in the top left, we had found um, Colton's map. Colton and company made it from 1869 um, that was relevant to the time, and we were able to pull that in uh, from the server, from the David Rumsey historical map collection. And then, um, do you want to talk about that area you pull in for the tribal lands? So one of the patterns that you know we see throughout this kind of thing is the dispossession of indigenous land and indigenous cultures and histories. And so we were able to find, or I was able to find, a map online through the US Forest Service that mapped every single session or seeding of land of a Native American tribal land to the United States government or the Kansas government, what have you. And so what you see here is isolated from hundreds of entries to, ch to show just the Ka uh, tribe entries, otherwise known as the Kanza. And you see, like, it's a pretty big portion of land, and so it's very much part of our history in Kansas, and we wanted to visualize that. Right, and unlike most of the other tribes who ended up resident in Kansas <coughs> over the course of the 19th century, the Ka were actually native to this place. And so, uh, you know, their, their land pass was broken up over the course of the early 19th century as the permanent Indian territory um, essentially was a required moving eastern tribes west or eastern tribes moved west. But then in 18, 7, 15, 18, 25, 1846, and 1870, the Ka tribe ceded increasingly large portions of their uh, reservation lands to the U.S. government. And finally in 1873, they were moved down into Oklahoma. And it's only in the last decade that they've reclaimed um, historical space in uh, Castle Grove. So that's part of what we want to capture is this, you know, negotiation over space that's so crucial to the history of Kansas. So, there we are. So thank you. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for your attention. And uh, thank you, everybody. I really have uh, enjoyed working with these uh, fabulous women on this project. So. Any questions or? Hi. Um, 
so Sarah, this is like mid, you said you're midstream in a book. Yes. And a lot of this is data that you've been, you, you've had access to. And so a lot of the work this week is visualizing, right? No, so I okay. had none of the material for that legislative history on hand. Um, I really liked the idea of getting a feel for the context leading up to the legislation, um, but I had done no work at all on that. Um, I've been working on legislative history for a later Homestead Act, and so I had a sense of what was there and what could be done. Um, but no, basically that first story map, I had no material for moving into this week. And so everything that we showed you was essentially populated by our collective research. For the second story map, um, I had a sense of what kinds of uh, moments I wanted to focus on, but most of the images came from our team. Um, the text came from my own work, but like the, you know, the text is like a paragraph here and there. Um, but mostly that second story. So the second story map I'm envisioning as being a prototype for a much larger series of story maps. Um, Carmen has found the story map series, um, which would allow you to sort of embed different story maps in a larger narrative. Um, and I want to be able to share that with the local history museums uh, in that region so that, you know, there's a little bit more balance in terms of the representation of the history of the place that's not just about little uh, highlights in uh, local history, but the larger stories beyond. So that was my attempt to see whether that process could work. That's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions for Sarah and the team? All right. Well, we'll turn it over to Melissa here. I'm. I'm. We're not going to bring the whole team up because basically we were all doing the same thing, and we were gathering information for Melissa's textbook, which has an international um, slant. We're, we're looking to uh, write this textbook so that international students can easily, it's easily accessible in language to international students because um, a lot of textbooks are not so easily accessible to somebody who's reading them in you know, a learned a second learned language. So that was our focus. But um, Melissa is going to do the whole presentation, and uh, I just want to acknowledge. Um, I'm I'm just like Greta. Um, I guess I should say what my name is too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Mary Rapple, and I work in international collections. I was a program manager, and. Um, uh, just like Greta said, uh, her job was easy. I, I had this amazing group of people, Fran Devlin, uh, Samantha Simmons, uh, Melissa had was ready to go right out of the gate and that really helped us take off very quickly. And um, Josh Bully came in and, and consulted with us as well as Natalie Mahan. And um, with all of that, we really got going on writing this text, and we have a good draft. Um, it's not complete, but a, a good rough draft of the most of the book. And we did that in a week. And uh, we're really pleased with the progress, but I have to lay a lot of the, um, the, the reason for the success on Melissa's awesome outline that she showed up with on the first day. And Carney Younger came in on our first day and just powered us through every single chapter and, uh, uh, you know, getting a basis for everything. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. Hi. Um, I'm Melissa Peterson. <coughs> I'm uh, in the Applied English Center. So our job is to teach international students uh, a level of English that they can basically survive outside of our pod <laughs> of department. Um, so... Without further ado, here's our project. Um, the goal of our project is essentially to create an open access textbook and 
then I saw the research sprints of open access, so I was like, this is me, I can do this. <laughs> um, and I love working with the librarians. Fran and Mary and I have been working together for uh, years, since 2013 maybe. And I've been working with Josh on and off, um, working on copyright, because he's the guy we go to for copyright. So, um, so the project, as we said, is an open access textbook. Um, also called an open educational resource, an OER. Uh, the two OERs that I've used most common with my students um, have, are from OSU and from SUNY. Um, the SUNY one was the one that kind of lit the fire under me because it was written for undergraduates, but not in a way that my students could grasp. It's very abstract. Um, the activities are a little bit confusing. And then the OSU one, the choosing and using sources with the little dots, it's written at such a high level of language that the students just can't, they, they can't, they're not ready. Um, so I found that there was a big gap in the resources. There wasn't really anything geared for international students. There's not a lot for undergraduates. I think people who write textbooks tend to forget that undergraduates exist um, at the research level. Um, and then of course there wasn't really anything for research skills in particular. So again, just to reiterate, the goals were to create um, an interactive textbook that students could essentially pick up, read, hopefully understand, and potentially complete an entire research project just going through the book, even without a class, without a teacher. Um, a lot of times when we were writing, uh, the five of us, uh, we were trying to write as if we were teaching the class. And so we wrote to the students, a lot of yous and kind of easy to pick up language. Um, and we also wanted to make learning about research skills something that was accessible, not scary. So the language is easy to pick up. Um, there's a lot of visual support, at least there will be. <laughs> it's not quite there yet, but there will be. Um, video support, um, interactive activities that give feedback. Um, and then also some cultural support, because there are differences between cultures in kind of ethical norms and research norms. Uh, what we expect in the United States Academy versus what international academies expect. Sorry about the pictures, this is Leanne's fault. <laughs> um, so our process, as Mary mentioned, um, before the sprint, um, I created a massive outline of kind of how I teach the course, how I teach research skills, things I thought were important to be included in the course, um, I put that in a Google Doc that Mary had organized prior. Um, Mary and I spent countless emails, emailing back and forth. We met a few times uh, to make sure that we had kind of hit the ground running, so to speak. Um, and then after Mary created our Google Drive for all of us, I just started putting stuff in the drive. She started putting stuff in the drive, and we had a lot already before Monday, um, which is really useful because it allowed us just to move forward. And so during the sprint, the first day we were kind of just sitting there like, what are we going to do with this outline? And Karna jumps up with a giant post-it <laughs> and a marker, and she's like, we're going to do it this way. And it was awesome because we got all of these post-its all over our wall. Each of these is a chapter. We were numbering them at first and realized this is a bad idea because we wanted them in different orders. Um, uh, it was just, it was such a great exchange of ideas, um, the five of us. I don't know, it was like we knew each other for decades. We just worked so well together. There was no anger. There was <laughs> nobody like attacked each other. It was very collaborative. Um, we all, everybody brought something special to the table. Um, so Karna had written a textbook, co-written a textbook that was open access before, so she kind of knew how to organize it and help us get directed. Um, Samantha works with undergraduates, so she kind of knew, and she teaches a UNIB course about evaluating sources, so that was her chapter, so if you like it, she wrote it. Um, and then, of course, Mary and Fran have worked with me for so long. They're basically me, but librarian form. <laughs> um, so everybody was really engaged. Everybody was really collaborative. Um, Josh came in multiple times. His office is actually the other side of the wall. Um, and he came in multiple times to give us help, to answer questions. Um, he was not policing us. He's not the copyright police. Um, but he is Nor is he a lawyer. Nor is he a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing I say can or should be construed as legal. There he is. <laughs> um, but he was very helpful. I was able to call him, Skype him, whatever I needed to do. Um, and then we learned about LibWizard, which we'll talk about later, because that was just like life-changing. 
Um, and then uh, Natalie came in and gave us some options about videos and kind of talked us through that process, which was helpful as well. Um, we had a few challenges because we don't have a good product without some obstacles. Um, one of our challenges is trying to find materials that are open access. That was one of the recommendations um, that Josh made was a true open access source will only have open access, openly licensed materials. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a whole bunch of stuff that I've used for teaching, but then when you publish and distribute, all the rules get a little bit more conservative and a little bit stricter. So I had to redo a lot of my pictures. I had to redo, just I had to do a lot of things I didn't think I would have to do. Um, the other uh, obstacle is accessibility. It's something I didn't realize we had to do in an open access book affiliated with the university. So we'll have to go and we'll um, have to use subject headings, make sure screen readers can access the, the images, uh, make sure everything's captioned if we make any videos. So I've emailed uh, accessibility here at KU waiting to hear back. They're probably on vacation, which we all should be too. <laughs> um, and then Karna has mentioned a couple of times that we need to make sure that the chapters are scaffolded, make sure the activities over are scaffolded. So we have a post meeting that we'll plan at some point to make sure that as we complete the chapters, make sure they're all very cohesive. Um, we don't want to talk about something in chapter two that we're actually talking about in chapter six. Um, we didn't know all the available resources at first, but now we do, so we're, we've passed that obstacle. Um, the platform continues to be somewhat of an obstacle. Uh, we don't know if we're gonna put it on Pressbooks or Editoria. Um, I'm hoping for Pressbooks. Um, and then just the mental exhaustion. I don't know if you've ever studied in a foreign country where you've had to use another language and you just crash at the end of the day. That was me, except for I have two small children and there's no crashing allowed. Um, <laughs> And then we just need more time. Like, I could use another week like this, but with more lunches, guys. <laughs> Where are you? We need more lunches. Um, but it, it was really, I mean, it was amazing. I cannot believe how much we accomplished in this week. Um, so just a little bit about our progression. Uh, like I said, pre-sprint, these are all of Mary's emails to me. But, and it's not even all of them. I couldn't shrink my screen. I guess you can't zoom out on Outlook. Um, but, and then of course, this is kind of a, the first version of the outline. It looks very different now because I've had four other voices, uh, which strengthened it immeasurably. <sighs> I'm talking fast, I'm sorry. Um, so the first day, like we said, Karna worked with us and she is responsible for all of those post-it notes. That's her handwriting back there. Um, and she kind of color coded them a little bit so they're easy to kind of follow. Um, we organized the chapters, uh, we brainstormed more information to add, things to delete, things to move, and we basically finalized the outline um, by lunch, I think. I think it was before lunch. Yeah. Maybe a little after lunch. It was basically done. It was amazing. And then uh, by the end of the day, we said who was responsible for which chapters. Um, everybody took a chapter or two or five um, <laughs> and uh, began writing the next day, which was great. So on the second day, um, we all hung out in our respective spaces in the morning to get some work done. Um, we, I hung out in a pod in the Union, if you want to know where that was. It was fabulous. I had a squishy ottoman. Um, and then I, I talked to Josh a couple times that day because I had pictures I was working with. And I'm glad I talked to him early because I would have had to redo a lot of things. Um, and then a couple of us met up in the afternoon to kind of start working together to keep our momentum going because we got a little bit tired. Um, and it gave us a chance to bounce some ideas off of each other as well. Um, and then the third day we spent the morning writing and then the afternoon, since most of our drafts were done enough, we came back together. Uh, we put all of the chapters up on the little TV thing we had up there and we talked through all the chapters, made sure they all made sense in order, made sure that the writing made sense. We followed Karna's formatting because we liked it. Um, we added a few activities, and then Samantha told us about LibWizard, which is the most amazing piece of software ever. It allows you to <laughs> create quizzes and tutorials, and they're interactive, and it's just it's really cool. Um, so that just changed like the trajectory of the activities in the book. And then the fourth day, we started uh, by writing, we modified any drafts that we needed to modify. There was a couple of things we decided we needed to change or amend. Um, and then we met with the sprint support team to work through logistics, and that was Natalie, Josh, and Karna. 
Um, they came in at various points throughout the day to give us some insight on video tutorials, uh, answer a thousand questions on uh, Kitchener's copyright and attribution, and then uh, Carter talked about the platform a little bit with us. And then we just started working on the presentation. That was <coughs> yesterday, but it felt like, it feels like it's been a week since that happened. Um, just to give you kind of an idea <coughs> of what it looked like, here's one of the post-its that we wrote. And then this is just a snapshot of the chapter. Um, it's like a page and a half of the chapter. I don't know if I can get out of here or not. Let me see. Um, so Mary created all this, this Google Drive for us, which has been amazing. All of the, you can't see it. It's cool. Um, that's OK. We don't need to look at it. So that's my daughter's. Don't look at that. <laughs> I know you still can't see. I'm very lucky right now. <laughs> my daughter took my computer last night while I was working, and she decided that she needed to type just like mommy does. <laughs> She's four. Um, so anyways, I will be able to show you the live view, but uh, this basically is just a very tiny part of that chapter. So we ended up being able to create almost done chapters with the exception of the interactive software. Um, and there's still some like things in there that we've got to fix. So these are the 10 chapters that we settled on. If anybody knows of anything else we should include, do we speak now or forever hold your peace? <laughs> but the license on the book is uh, by and NC and share alike. So you can actually take the entire book and you can add to it if you want and then cast it off as your own. So all hail to the license. Um, I will not be able to link out this, to this quiz, but the, we have these cool interactive quizzes and tutorials where you can put like the web page, an actual web page that's live, and then have students do things to that web page. And so they can practice uh, research skills in kind of a nice sheltered environment. And then if it's a quiz, it can send the results back to me as a teacher or as the book owner, I guess. And it's just, it's really neat. So if you haven't seen Lib Wizard, please check it out. It's going to make our book extremely interactive, which is wonderful. So the future. We thought that a rabbit looking down a hole was very indicative of our future. Um, we feel like, I said yesterday, I think we're 70% done, and I looked at Fran's face, and I was like, 60? 50. 50? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel very much like we've finished a lot, 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 but there's still a lot of things left to do. Um, we still need to complete the chapter drafts. There's actually one chapter I still need to write. Um, we need to create the visuals, videos, and tutorials, but that needs to come after the writing. Uh, incorporate the activities, scaffold the language activities. Um, we need to work on accessibility, and then we have to create a sustainability plan. Um, so we're just starting to go down our little rabbit hole. <laughs> so. Anyways, Mary made me put that picture there and told me not to delete it. <laughs> so, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, Brian. Uh, since LibWizard is proprietary, would that affect the openness? Or? Yeah, we're doing some research. So we're going to, she's kind of conceptualized this book as being twofold, you know, using at KU and using with her students and classes and also going out. So we're going to look at different open access versions of these quiz making sites, which we found many. We just need to decide which one is best for our uses. And then there's also going to be the option for people who take it and use it in other universities to insert their own activities. Um, and so we would just make a suggestion about the kind of thing to go in there. But yes, we know that LibWizard can't leave here. LibWizard mm -hmm. Revolution. <laughs> Um, so in our department, we use the CEFR scale, 
Um, and so the language will be tailored towards a B1 level. So that's kind of right in the middle of, you're not quite academically proficient yet. Um, our B1 students do not take KU academic classes. They're typically still in our program. Um, and so the language will be written at that level. So we're, we're not there yet. I have to go back through and look at all the language. Um, but it, not a lot of very complex structures. The paragraphs will be short, um, spaced out, and then a lot of visual support and a lot of video support. So trying to hit a multimodal um, experience. So some of, some of it visual, some of it audio. And then everything that's audio, of course, will be captioned and have accessibility. So that's the language part. Um, and trying to break down some of these ideas. If you look at the OSU book, it's very difficult to read. And they use words like serendipity. Like, exactly, right? Like, that's not a level three word. That's not a B1 word. You just don't get that early. Um, so I'm trying to also find words that are very concrete so that don't have a lot of um, weird meanings in different places. The other thing that we're doing is the chapter structure. So we'll have a preview portion for each chapter that will include vocabulary and difficult concepts so students can preview that material before they enter into the book. Um, we'll also have a glossary at the end that'll be cross-referenced. There's a lot of hopefuls here. You're right, it is like 50%. Um, <laughs> you win. Um, so that, that's the language portion. Um, and then the cultural portion, I'm hoping that I'm including information that I've seen my international students, and if you have anything, please email me, um, that my international students have struggled with. So plagiarism is the biggest thing that my students struggle with. Part of it's the language barrier. Part of it is just not understanding the ethical constraints of, of American research. Uh, so I, in my plagiarism chapter, which is not quite finished yet, I'm planning on approaching it as, you know, what if you don't have enough time? What do you do? That's a big, that's a common international student, domestic student too, but a common international student problem is they run out of time because they run out of ability to read the language of what they're reading. Um, but then also other cultural um, differences, like the PowerPoint presentation. Um, in my experience, international students like to play with PowerPoint and they like to make clouds as background and you know very animated <laughs> PowerPoints that make me dizzy. Um, and so uh, that's one of my chapters that you wouldn't normally see in a research skills book. But you can't conduct research if you can't disseminate your information. So does that answer your question enough? Yeah. yeah, and if you have any obstacles that you had as a student, please send them to me. And if I can address them, I will. And actually, one of the things I didn't talk to Martina about yet is um, I'm planning on emailing some professors here at the university and those that work with international students and seeing what they perceive as problems. I just came up with it like 3 in the morning last night. <laughs> and um, maybe try to create some kind of survey that they can send back to me and maybe I can incorporate some of those concepts in. Mm -hmm. Or their quotes and little cute boxes. And something else that Melissa did that I thought was really useful is, um, so a lot of this is stuff that they can, it's sort of half a textbook, half a workbook. And she uses one theme, she picked like deforestation of the rainforest. And there's detailed examples of how to apply these concepts given and then students are asked to do the exact same thing, but with their own topic of research. So she'll have the vocabulary, then she'll have an example, and then she'll have the ability for them to walk through it in the exact same way. So there's lots of reinforcement of concepts that she uses, and I thought that was really yeah. useful. Yeah, and the hope is that by the time that they finish reading the book, they've actually completed a research project, or at least a preliminary project. Um, the other thought is putting in the appendix kind of the workbook, just a blank part where they can answer questions and create kind of a research portfolio so when they finish, they have something to take away from. So you're starting to talk about this, so I'm wondering if you went into a little more depth about the actual assessment of the tool itself as a whole. No. Like, have you considered yes. any sort of pre-testing of the students before they start the class and then post-testing to see whether your tool has been effective in certain areas and not so much in other areas? I didn't think about that. I do have a pretest that I use for my graduate students because we have to score them at the beginning and the end for the programs that we work in. But that would be a good idea to have kind of a pre-assessment. We could do that for either the open access or the web reserve and then a post-assessment to make sure that they're understanding the concepts. And I, think I don't think it's the like number one too. priority. I, was no, but I like, I like that it. idea because I, I know a lot of international students, at least 
the ones that we've worked with, they like taking personal quizzes to see where they're at because they usually score themselves higher <laughs> in their knowledge than they actually are in their experience. Um, so I think that would actually be a very nice tool to say, yeah, you actually do need days. And if a student scores high on research questions, they can maybe can skip that chapter if they were doing it autonomously. Mm -hmm. So that would be fun. Somebody write that down. <laughs> <laughs> this video is like, oh. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you for your attention. I'm going to bail out now. <laughs>